today. It's it's my privilege and 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 great great pleasure to to be announcing uh, Jessica Sklar, who is a professor of mathematics and current mathematics chair at the Pacific Lutheran University. Her passion includes math, art, math, and pop culture, recreational mathematics, um, and abstract algebra. She co-edited a book in mathematics and popular culture uh, with Elizabeth S. Sklar and is a member of the Math Alchemy team, who was also represented today in, in the participants. Um, and without further ado, I will pass over to, to Jessica with uh, the talk, Mathematical Art Inspirations, Instantations and Installations. Thank you, Tiago. Um... Uh, just first start by saying thank you for uh, inviting me to speak here. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, I love the celebration of my talks and the, the gather sessions. So this is uh, a photo from the Math Malchemy Project, which I'll be talking about later in the talk. Um, it was taken by Henry Siegerman, who you can see here with the camera. It's a 360 wraparound. Uh, and my talk is titled uh, Mathematical Art, Inspirations, Instantiations, and Installations. I'm going to begin with an origin story of sort of my, the true beginnings of, of my uh, math art career, such as it is. Um, in January, 2020, right before lockdown um, happened, I went to the JMM, uh, which happened to be in Seattle, Washington, where I live. And I was giving a talk there with uh, Jennifer Nordstrom of Linfield uh, College about the game of chicken in films, uh, films like Crazy Rich Asians and Loose and things like this. Uh, and later that day, I went to a mathematical art session, um, and I, I sat down next to a woman who, who told me, you know, I, I really, really like your talk this morning. We started talking, and uh, it turned out she was a mathematical artist, and that was uh, Bronna Butler, who I've since uh, been collaborating with. So uh, what she showed me, she had a trifold card that she handed to me while we were sitting there, uh, and I immediately fell in love. Um, a, a sculpture she made uh, in honor of Martin Gardner. Um, later, we together named it Armand T. Branger, which I'm sure uh, some of you here know is a, a pseudonym that Gardner sometimes used. And in, in addition to it being beautiful, this, this uh, sculpture is actually made out of stained glass. Uh, it had on the trifold this sort of uh, image here, you see of, of Martin Gardner as a white rabbit. And I looked at this and I said, that's a visionaire cipher. And she was like, yes. And I, of course, I immediately had to decrypt it. And, and she said, you know, I'm looking for a math collaborator. Would you want to collaborate on math art? And even though I'd never done visual art before, I said, yes, let's do it. Um, and so we began our, our collaboration. And uh, in the midst of this, I asked Tom Edgar, my colleague who's editor of Math Horizons, if he might be interested in a uh, piece on Brana for the magazine. And so uh, he was excited about that. And so uh, we, well, I wrote an article um, based on a conversation I had with Brana and it was published in the February, 2021 issue of Math Horizons. And here you see at the top of the page, that was our first real collaboration. And so I wanna um, unpack that a little bit. Uh, in the magazine, we also on the last page had a puzzle uh, you may recognize pieces of this uh, potentially from the, the trifold card. And uh, these were uh, images, hexahexagons with images based on some of Gardner's uh, popular columns in Scientific American. And so this was, uh, in a sense, our first puzzle uh, that we created together. This was the puzzle in that issue of Math Horizon. But our first real uh, collaborative piece came apart this way. We, at the same meeting, went to a presentation by Ingrid Dobuchy and Dominique Erman, um, mathematician and artist, respectively, about the Math and Alchemy Project. They envisioned this large, uh, multi-sort of media uh, installation, art installation. They were looking for collaborators. Um, it ended up being a wonderful project. Um, there were more than 30 people who got heavily involved and then lots of people involved uh, beyond that at various levels. Uh, it's currently on display at the National Academy of Sciences and I'll talk more about that later. Um, but one aspect of the Mouth and Alchemy exhibit is that there's this cavalcade of fabric pages um, and that's hard to picture. I'm sure I'll have a photo that gives an idea of it later on. Um, and we, 
proposed various pages for this, and Brana proposed this. So this is a, a sketch by Brana um, of a Venn diagram, right? And as you can see, the circles are titled Math, Art, and Abstraction, and they're filled in appropriately. So the art has a very, you know, art only has a very artistic rendering of a fish. Um, we've got sort of abstract art in, in the intersection of art and abstraction with some, some uh, you know, geometrical figures and so on. And I thought this was beautiful, but I sort of secretly told Brana, I, I think we could do better. And, and she was eager to, to try. And so this is what came out of that. Um, so we, you know, got some stuff in the math section with our, you know, secret lines and tangent lines. I've got a commutative diagram in here. Uh, her fish are, you know, beautifully rendered and coming out of, out of the art uh, circle. And then we've got this uh, hyperbolic tiling uh, in the middle. And so it really, uh, I think, you know, give it more life. Um, and I've noticed that uh, it, it works really well in photographs, the colors just pop. Uh, the colors here were made additively. So that when you do the additive uh, mixing instead of uh, what we're used to uh, with mixing colors, if you do red and green, you get yellow and so forth. So that was our, just sort of interesting. It was our first collaboration. That was in JMM 2021 virtual uh, art gallery. Uh, and uh, the fabric version bed is in Mathematical. And this was our, our next piece. So the, where this came from um, is we wanted to do something nice for Dr. Tom Edgar, the, the editor of Math Horizons. He, he did a really great job helping us uh, with the paper that we did. And he's also just over the years been a, a really great friend and collaborator uh, for me. And, and Brana has said, let's do something nice for him. And, and we thought about what, what could we do. And I know Tom, who I think is here today, likes ciphers as many of us do, um, ciphers and you know cryptography. And so I thought, well, let's make a, a cipher for him. And I came up with the idea because we were gonna do visual art of a color cipher. Um, and you can see uh, that represented here in, in this piece. So I'll tell you this much, one of these two things is the key to the cipher and one of them is the cipher text. Um, part of the you know puzzle, it, this is a puzzle, is to figure out which is which, and then how to use the key to to un decipher the cipher text. And you might wonder what's up with the the dog. Um, when I decided to do the cipher, and it uses these triangles, I also know that that uh, Tom does a lot of proof about words and other things involving triangles. So I thought, okay, it's a triangle cipher, and I remember that Tom um, Dog at the time was named Try because uh, it was tricolor. And uh, so I went and I, I stalked photos of Tom's dog. I looked on his Facebook and I got photos from his, our departmental secretary. Um, and in particular, this, this photo. So this one is a photo. This really uh, spoke to both Brona and I. And so we chose that one to work with. Over here, the one you see, this is actually an oil painting. Um, this piece and so this gorgeously rendered dog, which is all thanks to Brana. Brana does all the, the art art or most of the art art for our collaboration. Um, this was a, her beautifully painted rendition of Try. Um, and uh, this was in the For the Love of Math art show sponsored by the Seattle Math Museum uh, at the Suzanne Zarr Gallery uh, in Mercer Island uh, last fall. And it was great to watch people try to decipher it. Um, if you want to try your hand at it, uh, there's a link here which will take you to um, some walkthroughs for the decryption. So you can just, you know, if you want to, you can just look at the pictures at the top and try to decrypt, or you can sort of go through it's like a video game walkthrough um, to figure out what the, the actual message is. And we wanted to do something else with the triangles. Brana especially wanted to do something else with the triangles. And so she started sending me images of, you know, various uh, triangle involved shapes online so we could do another cipher. And I, I was very picky about it. They weren't speaking to me. I didn't like this one. I didn't like that one. Um, and then I came across, I think I actually found this through a Google image search of all things. I came across this image uh, from, uh, I'm going to 
terrible with the name, is Alice Droppel and Carlo, I'm not even going to try the last name, uh, their paper, mathematician's paper on an enumeration of equilateral triangle dissections. And I thought these just looked really cool. Um, and so I chose, uh, we, I showed these to Brana and she was up for it. So we chose one of them. We actually chose this one that you see, I think in the middle right here, because uh, for us that composition looked the best. And we created a second color cipher piece. So this is Equilateral Enigma. This is sort of a companion piece to, to color coded. Uh, again, you have a key and a cipher text putting these together. You can probably tell now which is the key and which is the cipher text. Um, it was a, a little harder to decrypt um, because of a lack of linearity in the cipher text. I'm, I'm giving it all, well, not at all. I'm giving some of it away right now. So with the other one, all you really needed is the key and some legwork. <laughs> this one, it, it felt like you needed more. Um, in fact, I know you needed more because otherwise you don't know how to read the order of the, the cipher text uh, characters. And so I wrote a little, a little poem at the bottom uh, Alice and Carlo have planted the trees among whose ranks a message is veiled. Moon precedes sun and large precedes small colors, the key to decrypting it all. And that uh, here tells you, along with this image at the side, how to go and, and read the, the cipher uh, text and decrypt it for this one. And here are just some photos of people <laughs> trying to decrypt these. Uh, at the at the gallery, so it was really really enjoyable to sit there and, and watch them, watch kids and adults get into sort of uh, heated discussions, shall we say, about how these things should actually uh, be decrypted. Uh, you can see, by the way, a little piece here of a, a sketch Brana did. This was a, a preliminary sketch for a thing that appeared in Math and Alchemy, where chipmunks in the garden are uh, exploring prime numbers. And the same um, for the love of math exhibit, I did my first, maybe my only, but my first uh, solo piece. So this uh, was one I did without Brana. You can see it does not involve glorious oil paintings because uh, that is not my forte. So this was uh, called Still Life with Mathematics. And it, this is a coffee table that was in the um, installation. And uh, I have in it, what you see on the piece of paper is my poem Disciple. And that was a poem that I wrote coming out of a um, mini course on humanistic mathematics at an earlier uh, JMM conference. And uh, so I wrote that poem's response and it's a love poem for mathematics. Uh, and I created this piece as sort of a, a love poem, if you will, for my thesis advisor, Frank Anderson, uh, who was at uh, University of Oregon. And he was just, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people feel like this about their thesis advisors, but he was just the best. He was, he was warm, he was kind, he was brilliant. Um, and I, I miss him a lot. He passed away a few years ago. So uh, I had the poem, I had, this is his book uh, that he co-wrote um, on, uh, had, on uh, rings and modules, basically. And uh, on the blackboard, you see pieces of my dissertation, um, which involved, uh, what are called binomial algebras and involve quivers, uh, which would be cute names for these uh, little digraphs. Um, and, and so this was my piece for him. Um, and I'll just mention, even though this isn't related to math and art, this cup of coffee is fake. I found it on Etsy and it is the best fake food thing like I've ever seen. People actually picked it up thinking it was real coffee. They shouldn't be picking up pieces of an art exhibit, but you know how people are. And then I saw other people putting their drinks down on the installation because, you know, there's a cup of coffee there. Why not? And this is, of course, Frank. This was uh, Frank the day I got my PhD. Uh, so most of those pieces were collaborations. The, the last one I showed was mine only, but I figured uh, Ron and I together make QED arts. I've been seeing QED arts here, and I should have clarified QED arts. Uh, for the time being, QED Arts LLC is this very small collaborative group consisting of me and Brana, and we would love for other people to join us. So by all means, if you're interested in collaborating, if you have ideas, come on in. Uh, this is our planned piece. So this uh, is, is um, hopefully something we're gonna submit to uh, Bridges for um, Finland this summer. There, I've said it, Brana, if you're here, uh, now we really should have to do it. Uh, and it's a piece, Obviously, this is not ours. This is Durer's uh, Melancholia One. 
from um, the 16th century. Uh, and what um, Bronna noticed in it that she's really interested in, uh, and I'm also interested in, is, is this thing at the top, which is a magic square. And I think a lot of you probably know what magic squares are. Here's a, a zoomed in version of it, a detail. Um, magic squares are basically rectangular or square, I should say, square grids of numbers, where every row of numbers and every column of numbers and every diagonal numbers, uh, diagonal of numbers, and sometimes other collections of numbers all add up to the same number, which is called the magic number for the square. And so in this case, that magic number is 34. If you add up say 16 and 3 and 2 and 13, you're going to get 34. Um, this paragraph down here is adapted from a, a website uh, where there's an article that sort of unpacked all the number combinations that, that add up to 34 here. Um, and it claims there are 86 different combinations of four numbers from the square that add up to the, some of the magic juror number. Uh, I have not independently verified that, so I'm just going to take their, their word from it, for it. And Brana's idea, because, you know, again, we like puzzles. Uh, not all of our pieces, but many of our pieces involve puzzles. And she thought, well, well, we could do is have a there's magic square, but have a cat covering up one of the numbers or some of the numbers. And uh, so she did this. This is a sketch from um, a sketchbook that she contributed to the Brooklyn Art Library sketchbook project uh, called Math Plus Arts Plus Cats. Uh, this is actually my cat Aurelia um, from a photograph. Uh, again, this is a sketch she did, um, covering up part of this number here. Um, and I actually thought we could make it a little more interesting. So what we'll actually end up doing is uh, a project where the magic square is different. Um, the magic square isn't going to be the one in Durs Melancholy. It'll be a different one, but still the idea is there with the cat uh, covering up some of the numbers. Um, and the puzzle will be to, to you know, figure out what the missing numbers are. Um, and in, uh, yeah, it'll be sort of in the style of Melancholy. I'll turn now to the Math and Alchemy project, which if you went to that gather in January or uh, have been reading in uh, various magazines, uh, you will have heard about. So um, this again, this was the brainchild of Ingrid Bilberti and uh, Dominique Ehrman. And this is, it's a big installation. It's about 16, I wanna say 16 feet by uh, 10 feet by nine feet high, something like that. I didn't do a final check on the numbers before I um, came to give this talk today. Uh, and it is currently on display at the National Academy of Sciences, as I said, and so it, it, you know, it doesn't fill that room because it's a big room, but it, it is a large piece. And so Brana created this gorgeous map for it. This is actually um, on, I believe this map was created by request from the um, AMS notices. There was going to be an article about the piece in the notices. I don't think it's come out yet. Uh, and they requested a map. And so Prana created this and it shows just sort of the overall uh, shape and what's going on in this big installation. The purpose of the installation is to celebrate mathematical creativity, to be playful, um, it's to appeal to the general public and have great artistic value. Uh, and so it's got all kinds of uh, different aspects uh, to it that you can see. You could spend probably days and not see everything uh, in this. I will direct people who are interested to look at the Math and Alchemy uh, webpage, which I have a link to, I think I have a link to at the, the end of this talk. It's full of photographs. It's full of uh, blog posts about creation and about stories within the the piece. It's got links uh, that outline the mathematical details that are represented uh, in the exhibit. It's really extensive and it's really profound. So I, I highly recommend exploring that. Uh, and what I'm going to focus on uh, in this talk, although I have other pictures of things, uh, is Tessa's story. Tess is this tortoise that you see here. And I'm, I'm focusing on her because she was my big contribution to the piece, not the actual Tess herself, uh, whose body was knitted by Kim Roth and whose uh, shell was created by ceramicist Liz Paley, but because Tess was my story. Um, originally, Dominique sent out a sort of a call for stories for the installation, and I, I sent her this very vague thing that said something about infinity, and it could have like, the, you know, um, you know, paradox, and I don't know, some, and I listened to some other stuff, and she wrote back, and she said, this is not a story. <laughs> I said, it is not a story. So I wrote a story, and again, one day Tess woke up and decided she would take a walk. 
And so Tess Tortoise goes on a walk and learns about infinity. And so here's, uh, just before I get to that, here's a picture of some of the participants in the Math and Alchemy team. Here's Ingrid, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, at professor at Duke University. And here's uh, Dominique Hermann, a uh, Quebec-based uh, artist. Um, Here's me, and then I saw Faye is in the audience today, and Brana, I think, was in the audience today. There may be others here as well, and there's probably some familiar faces to those of you who are, who are involved in, in math and art or the Gathering for Gardner. We've got Carolyn Yackel and Susan Goldstein, and uh, here's Henry Segerman and, and, and so forth. So here's Tess's story. So Tess wakes up, she's gonna go for a walk, and. She's gonna walk along what I call Zeno's path. Zeno's path is based uh, on the paradox involving Atalanta, um, where you have a path, you need to get from point A to point B, but to get there, first you need to go halfway, and then you need to go half of the remaining distance and half the remaining distance and half the remaining distance and so on. So you have to traverse, if you think of it that way, infinitely many intervals to get from point A to point B. So it sort of seems like you're never gonna get there. Uh, but of course you do. And the reason for that is really the convergence of a mathematical, particular type of mathematical series. And so I'm not gonna go into the details of that. You can certainly look on Wikipedia, look up Zeno's you know, paradoxes and you'll, you'll find those there. Um, and I got the tortoise idea from a different one of Zeno's you know, paradoxes. So here's Tess, she's walking along Zeno's you know, path, which again, uh, has these, you know, half the distance is half of what's left and so forth. And we indicated that by different sizes of these stones. So halfway through the stones are this size, the fabric stones. Uh, and then for another quarter, they're half the size and, and then the another eighth or um, a quarter of the size and so on. Um, I hope I'm getting the ratios right there. And uh, so here's Tess walking. Tess is flying a, a tetrahedral kite, which is basically a representation of a Sierpinski tetrahedron. If you've ever heard of a Sierpinski triangle, where you take a triangle and then you remove the middle triangle um, from it and you move uh, the middle triangle from those and so forth, it's a fractal process. Uh, this is the 3D version, Sierpinski tetrahedron. Uh, I think this is the third iteration. I might be, be, be off on that. It sort of depends what you consider the zeroth iteration of the first. So we've got the idea of infinity in Zeno's path. We've got the idea of infinity in this kite. Uh, here's on her to-do list, and you can see this beautiful shell that Liz made. On her to-do list, it's got a little bit of a mathematical explication of uh, the intervals that she's traversing. And just for kicks, kicks I thought, um, let's do a billboard advertising Hilbert's Hotel. Uh, some of you may have heard of Hilbert's Hotel. It's this idea where you have a hotel and there are infinitely many rooms. There's room one and room two and room three and so on. And uh, one night someone comes, to the hotel and the hotel is full. Every room has someone in it. Uh, and the person says, I'd like a room. And even though the room is full, the proprietor says, oh, not no problem. And they move everyone to one room higher. So they move the person in room one to room two, the person in room two to room three and so on. And they put the, the new arrival in room one. So again, it's this other idea of, of infinity. Uh, and I just thought that it would be fun to have like a, a billboard uh, here and then we just had some fun playing with it. Cable TV, pets allowed, you know, just to make it uh, more cute. And then, of course, rooms always available. Uh, and this is cute too. I like that it's alpha not kilometers past integral hill. Alpha not is the cardinality of the the integers. The in the sense, the number of the set of all numbers, all whole numbers. And uh, the other uh, aspects of Tessa's story are, we've got, oh, so I, I should mention this hill, you can sort of see if you've ever seen calculus two or integral calculus, you've probably seen Riemann rectangles, uh, which you use to approximate uh, integrals. And again, that sort of suggests the idea of infinity as you let the number of integral uh, rectangles go to infinity, you get better approximations of area. And so you can see that the, these uh, boards for that wall kind of represent Riemann rectangles. And then integration comes into play here as well. We've got, uh, this is called integral hill. That's the combination of these little bag terraces and these uh, Riemann cliffs. And uh, the idea here is these cliffs are sort of suggesting Riemann integration and the, the 
uh, terraces are suggesting Lebesgue integration. Uh, and that's sort of almost all the aspects of the story. Again, integrals involve sort of infinite processes and limits. And then at the top of the hill, which we call Coke's Peak, uh, there's Coke snowflakes falling. I don't have images of those. Those are laser cut um, by Ed Vogel, Ed Vogel's um, designs, and uh, then uh, sort of given uh, more features by um, one of our participants. So uh, at the top there are these coax circles, another fractal infinite uh, idea there. Um, you can see here, I mentioned chipmunks in the garden. Um, there's some chipmunk sorting primes that you can't really see here, but there's these other chipmunks um, here are uh, looking at the sieve of Eratosthenes. We've got, for those of you who are curious, here's the Alexander Horn sphere. There's all kinds of mathematical stuff happening. Um, we've got all this origami is by Faye Goldman. Uh, and then we've got Dinah, I think, crocheted this um, piece here and, and various things. I mentioned the cavalcade of pages earlier, and that's what you see a very small portion of here. Um, just another picture just to show you how, how cute and how beautiful some of these things are. This is uh, the bay, um, and this is from our nautical scene, K-N-O-T, get it, not, not theory. Um, you see you've got some knots here. Uh, and so forth. And another piece of the installation is a lighthouse. We have a bay, we have water, so we have a lighthouse. And Brana created this. Uh, Brana, the other half of QED Arts, created this uh, beautiful stained glass dodecahedron um, that is basically the beacon. It contains Fresnel lenses uh, and actually that shine out, uh, you can see here sort of what it creates the way a regular lighthouse would. And if you notice, there's the top top itch is yellow and the other part is uh, this red color. And this um, is based on an article in Quantum Magazine uh, about sort of paths from vertices to other vertices on the dodecahedron. So I won't go into, into details of that, but if you go to the Mathematical Me blog post on the dodecahedron, you can find um, information about that magazine article. Uh, at the top, you also see a stereographic projection. This was uh, the design of Henry Siegerman. I also want to draw attention to Brana's gorgeous octopi mural. Uh, this is uh, painted, and actually you'll see in the next slide, it was painted on a kind of complicated uh, walls that bend. So these are where the bends are. Uh, and we've got like the wave equation here, right, with the waves. And we've got, I think this is the Navier-Stokes equation with the way the smoke is modeling. We've got octonians over here. So just a really, beautiful and colorful uh, painting. Here it is actually on the some of the walls. Um, this is the back of the curio shop uh, here. And then this is how it actually appears in the installation. So sadly, a lot of it is, is covered up. This is, you're peeking at the octopus here at Octopi, uh, the octopus through the, the metal lighthouse. Uh, the fabric pages, here's our additive mixing that I, I talked about before on our page. And I love that the, the little fish come and actually leave and are, are swimming here in the air. Uh, this is from that, um, right, you saw this before. This was the puzzle uh, in Math Horizons. And then this is one I did uh, because my skill, artistic skills for visual arts are lacking, but my logic skills are strong. I used an a image of Galois, um, open source image of Galois that I found. And on top of it, I imposed uh, sort of this, this extension field Q adjoining the fourth root of 2i and it's uh, Galois group uh, over Q. And uh, I'm definitely not going to go into that. That's some hardcore math. But it's this actually, the fundamental theorem of Galois theory when I got my, when I was a uh, graduate student, it blew my mind. It was just like the most beautiful math thing I'd ever seen. And so I like the idea of incorporating it here. And I like the idea, if you notice, these are what are called duels of one another. The one, lattice at the bottom is the one at the top upside down. So that also made its way to a fabric page. Uh, more puzzles. This is a cryptography quote. Now this is, this photo was taken uh, at Durham where we were constructing it. It's not in the, uh, taken in the actual um, museum that it's or the building that it's currently in. All of these different panels are uh, representing different types of cryptography. This is just a close up on, on one of them, the cipher wheel. And you see that they also contain cipher text. So this has a cipher text. This has a cipher text where the cipher is binary and so forth. 
And then about, I, I didn't want this to be a more than, much more than half an hour. So just a few more photos to tantalize you. Uh, to go, if you can see Math and Alchemy, where it is now or elsewhere, or maybe invite it to a place near you. Uh, we've got Conway's Curio Shop, named after John Conway. Uh, and here it's got lots of little mathematical artifacts. We've got the Conway Knot. Uh, I think uh, Susan Goldstein made that. We've got a Klein bottle. We've got all kinds of, here's, I think, some Baromian rings in there. Uh, I wanted to mention just, just two things you can see here. This is the Harris Spiral. This was discovered by Edmund Harris, who was also a participant in the project. Um, and it's a gorgeous fractal spiral. You can see it here. It, well, not so well in the picture, but you can see some of it on the signs. You can also see it sort of on the back wall there. Um, in addition to Harris's, uh, Edmund's spiral being here, Edmund did all this wood construction. Um, so really amazing, amazing work on his part. And then this is um, a little mouse quilt on the wall. This was knit, uh, sewn by Mary William, but it was a pattern created by Susan Goldstein. Um, and Susan has, you'll see in the next photo, there's a, what we call the mouse wall, which is a tapestry representing, uh, was it, I think 12 of the wallpaper groups and this, this quilt represents the other five. Again, I'm throwing a lot of math terms out here with the idea that people are curious, they can go look at the blog. This is uh, the Mandelbrot Bakery. I thought that was super cute. So this is the sign for it. Uh, of course, Mandelbrot, people in math know the Mandelbrot set this uh, fractal, um, but also Mandelbrot is a cookie. So it made sense for us to, to call it the Mandelbrot Bakery. So here's the sign for it. And here's just an image in the bakery. Here's this mouse wall that I was talking about with a bunch of the wallpaper groups represented. We have a hop vibration here in that picture. We've got the uh, Mandelbrot set over here. These pie cookies are shaped in a way that will um, basically tile the dough so that there's no leftover dough. At the end, uh, the floor is a tiling by Marjorie Rice. And I could, you know, I could go on and on and on. There's just, there's so much to unpack. It. Again, go to the blog. So that was uh, just a taste of, the, of Math and Alchemy here. Um, and just, uh, note that the installation is going to be touring um, before it settles into its permanent home at the new math building at Duke University. Uh, it's currently on display at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. Um, and it's got like a whole room of its own there. It's really gorgeous. I know they're intending on having an activities day, um, but it's, the date for that, I, I think, is to be announced because COVID. Um, but if you know of an institution that might be interested in hosting Math and Alchemy, uh, please email Shannon Jacobs and here's her, her address here because we, we really would love to have it go to various places. It could be universities, it could be museums, it could be whatever. And uh, that's it. So I just have a, a, a post these, uh, well, these slides are already posted online if you want to go to them. So I've got here, this is the link to the slides, um, which of course you don't need if you already have the slides, but if you're watching the video, you can find the slides here. Those decryption walkthroughs for color-coded and uh, equilateral enigma, you can find here. This is the Math and Alchemy website, just so full of rich materials. Um, QD Arts, we're trying to, you know, build our following slowly. Uh, well, we're trying to build it quickly, but it's growing slowly. Uh, so we've got our Twitter and Instagram here, and then my information and, and Brona's information. Um, this is just my school webpage. It's not terribly exciting, but bronabutler.com has all of her art, mathematical and otherwise. And I, I highly recommend um, taking a look at it. It's really that's some just astounding stuff. But I think that's it. I've talked for a long time and I think things are in the chat. So I hope there are questions. Well, thank you so much, Jessica, for, for, uh, for well, this setup and then for this beautiful guided tour through, through. Uh, math Mal alchemy and there were already some comments and people are currently commenting in the chat um how beautiful the the exhibit is um there were some questions further through through the through the through the chat um some of them have been answered already like where the the first uh, gallery picture was you showed early on in the in the in the, in, in the presentation i believe it was seattle uh but it has already been answered in the chat and um uh, yeah so quick clarification i know what you're talking about it's the seattle area but it's technically mercer island which i think is arguably a different township but yes it's, it's basically seattle so thank you for the clarification so the two questions i have so far written out 
um, is, is one is, is a little bit more existential, is what comes first uh, in your creative process. If it's the, the puzzles first or if, if the art comes first uh, in, the, in the creative pr uh, process and the question comes with, with a high uh, praise of, of and appreciation of your art as well, which I will have just transliterate. <laughs> So is that, that's a really good question. I'm not sure how well I can answer it. Um, among other things, because I'm only one half of, of QED Arts. And so um, for Brana, I, I, I'm certainly not sure what her answer would be. I think, I think for me, if, if we're trying to do a puzzle piece, it, it's in a certain sense, the puzzle comes first. So it's, you know, let's do a cipher for Tom. And so that sort of was the the thing and then what would build from that um and for Braun it's like, oh let's you know she had this idea of let's do a this magic square but covering up some of the numbers uh so I think I think if it's a puzzle piece is for me at least it would be the puzzle that comes first and then the art built around it um that being said if you had an idea for a piece I would certainly try to see I think we would try to see can we get a puzzle in there right it's, it's and not always I mean additive mixing isn't there's no puzzle in there although I, I like I think one of the things I like about additive mixing that was the, one, the Venn diagram even though there isn't a puzzle in it per se other than maybe figuring out what are those things in the what is that thing in the center it, that's hyperbolic tiling of a what um it also, we have an activity for it for related to math and alchemy where your kids or adults, kids of all ages, are encouraged to, to sort of take a Venn diagram that we have a template for with math, art, and uh, abstraction and fill it in in their own way. And so that's not really a puzzle necessarily, but it's interactive. And I think that's one thing um, that I, I really like about art pieces that, that you know, either we make or that, that I find, or I really like ones that are interactive and sort of uh, speak to me, whether it's puzzles or or something else. Um, you know, I think in a certain sense, math and alchemy, it definitely has puzzles in it, but beyond that, it, it has stories in it. And I think that's another, it's, it's sort of the same idea as a puzzle, even if it isn't something to be solved. It's a way to, it's a way to relate. It's a way to be brought into, into the art rather than just sort of looking at it. Uh, from a purely sort of mathematical or aesthetic viewpoint. I hope that sort of answered the question. I, I believe it, it was a very, very good insight in, in, into part of your creative process. Okay. And, um, something I noticed myself while, while you were giving us the guided tours is the, the attention to detail and someone else um, pointed out, um, and this is, this is the other question I had, I had picked out, is um, at some points you, you uh, dual, well, the question is duals, Pun intended, and I guess duels and duals. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, so uh, that I am here's the reference to. So, so we've got the mathematical dual do you al, which is when you take something and sort of turn it on its, its head. That's a very rough description, and it can be used in various contexts in mathematics. So, but for instance, this idea of flipping over that lattice, uh, and I, I, that person is surely drawing reference to the dual, D-U-E-L, um, that Gawa uh, had. Gawa was quite the, there are a number of mathematicians in history who are quite the characters, and, and uh, Gawa was one of them. So yes, that, I, I, that hadn't even occurred to me, but that is pretty funny. Maybe I should call it uh, Gawa's dual. I didn't have a title for it, but now I do. The question is, how do I spell it? I don't know. <laughs> well, in, in that regard, I had also noticed very early on the Venn diagram, uh, the intersection between mathematics and arts is the Vesia pieces. So the, the, the intersection between two uh, two circles is the Vesia pieces, and which is basically the fish. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, maybe I can get, let's see how quickly I can get back to it. Not that quickly. Okay, so here you're talking about the the, the math and art, the this uh, sort of Escher-like tessellation here. Yeah. Yeah. This actually um, tessellation by Brana, um, like she created that tessellation, but it's certainly inspired by by Escher. Uh, so my my question my question. Oh, yeah, was, sorry. Is the pun intended as well? Uh, so because the Vesia pieces is is literally the fish uh, fish uh, I kind of thing and then it's it's the, the technical name from the arts perspective of oh i didn't i didn't know that 
<laughs> See, you were saying this. I'm like, I'm not, I'm, I don't know what these words mean. So I, I didn't realize that. I'll, I'll have to look that up. I'm sure Bronna can explain it to me. But that's so, so, uh, I, I, I'm, I might be mistaken as well, but, but I, I encountered the, 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 the technical name for the intersection of two circles as being Vesia pieces and, and so linked to oh, the that's fish. That's hilarious. Fish eye. Yeah. Thank you. I had no idea. <laughs> that, that's terrific. I misunderstood. And, and so you are, you're getting some suggestions uh, in the chat of, of how to call or how to spell dual dwell. Uh, oh. And so you're having double letters like the, the AE uh, uh, agglomerated together. And oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> nice. That's very clever. I like it. And I believe there are no more questions as far as I can see. So thank you, everyone. And I will be closing the meeting. Bye-bye. Thanks.